Welcome back to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. What, what uh, I think it's Irish, no? Yeah. But I'm trying to go for Gibraltar. Do you get that a lot because the red hair? No, I don't. I'm not a lucky charm. Okay. True. Lucky sure. charm, eh? I wish I could what's try the, lucky charm. What's cereal. the. Do you? I feel bad for people like. Ruin Feinstein was on the. It's such a reputable podcast. I'm like, now you want to wish I could lucky eat lucky charms. charms. Um, so, yeah, we. Okay. This, this, the way we got to this person is, is crazy and incredible. I was living in, in Ert Stroll and I was going back to America and like any good uh, coal guy, you want to stop off to save some money, but also you stop off and, you know, hey, turn it into a trip. Mm-hmm. And someone just suggested to me, hey, why don't you go to Noiki Roberts, um, my uncle, um, I think it was the Bladders. And, and I'm like, where, where does he live? And they said, Gibraltar. And I'm like, it's not Gibraltar, which I think you also Gibraltar thought. or Gibraltar? It's Gibraltar, but I think most people, a lot, most, a lot of people call Gibraltar. And I said, okay, let's do it. And I didn't really know much about it. And it, I, after that time there, I'm like, this is one of the most beautiful communities I've ever been to in my life. What, what was so beautiful about it? Well, you'll hear more about it in this episode oh, okay. with Noiki. But like Noiki, the way I met Noiki, I, he's just like some stranger who just took us in. And really, I think he's he's like, I, I don't know what Avram Avinu did with Hachna Zorchem, but I think he knows how to do that. Wow. We felt yeah, so good. He extended an invite to me to come to... Um, Gibraltar could you really, could you with my go? family could yeah, you I'm really ready to show my will you know I'm really looking forward to that trip I also want to just make note that I love the name Noiki yeah I, I don't know like, if I love it as much as you but I, I feel like it should cool be name. spelled like like Noki like G-N-O-C-H-I yeah, yeah, I, I think I, I reference it Noki and you're like oh, a classic thing classic here. linger yeah to mention so rub- a guy's name like potato puff pastry <laughs> thingies <laughs> but he's an incredible person and 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 not as well known as he should be and he's not the type of guy looking for covered but we're like rub noki we need to have you we're on. gonna cover you up yeah <laughs> 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 enjoy the episode welcome to the meaningful people podcast the podcast where we talk to people who are meaningful yeah that sounds good People who travel to Spain, they, they can just drive over to Gibraltar. Like, well, it depends what you're coming into. If you're coming into Barcelona, for example, which is the northern Spain, right, which is no chance, popular, mate. It's no? over a thousand kilometers away. I mean, you Americans drive a thousand miles without thinking about it. Fourteen hours to go to from New York to Atlanta. You, you mental offense, do it. Yeah, we I've don't. done it. I've done Chicago. <laughs> there you go. You see, so but a, a Spaniard or a, or a, a European wouldn't wouldn't dream of it. Really? No, they wouldn't do it. You guys Madrid. Like I've got a, a, a brother-in-law who works for Meridian Capital. Oh really? Yeah. Here? Yeah, I mean, he, he lives here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very nice. Yeah, Dabs. Dabs. your brother. Dabs. You know Dabs from I know Kids of Courage. Of him. Yeah, Ellie, Ellie, friendly with Ellie. Yeah, yeah, yeah I Dabkin. recognize that name. Yeah. name. yeah. So I've been on Kids Long of Courage trips like three or four times. Been the rabbi, mm-hmm. the singer, the you know whatever. And I think I've seen you sing. It could be. I think I've seen you sing places. That could be. I mean, I'm not. I don't do it f- a lot. Right. Because I have a, a real job, but. So when I get the gigs, I, I do. For those who just tuned into our conversation, just smack in the middle, and you hear an accent. Lovely. Where's that accent from, huh? England. England. Absolutely. Born and raised. Born and raised. Northeast of England. Northeast. Gateshead. Do you still live in England? I Not today, no. I don't live in England. I live in Gibraltar. Gibraltar? Yes. And in fact, Gibraltar got mentioned in a podcast, Meaningful People podcast. Did it. And the Gibraltarians went wild. All like 150 these, of them. Yeah, right? <laughs> nah, which episode did that Which come episode? Out? That's I'm good not, trivia. Um, I don't know which episode it was in, but you, you were, someone was talking about meaningful places or something like that. Maybe it was a recenter. Because I know we were talking about like... I don't think it was a recenter. No? Mm. Maybe it was... I think Dr. it was Benji? a recenter. No, because he's talking about like the trips that Yeshiva goes on. No? Maybe. Yes, it was. Yeah, it, it was. was. It was Rami mentioned like Matthew Bulgaria, a free, uh, Sophia. Minute book. I got a free minute. No yeah. way. Oh, my gosh. And <laughs> ah, that's where you mentioned off. Gibraltar. And I've got a bone to pick with you because... Okay. Oh, <laughs> man, what I do. Who's one second. Can we just second? break that down? Yeah, sure. Bone to pick. Oh, sorry. It's an English thing <laughs> of like... I don't know. I guess... You did something wrong, so I'm going to call you out. At least you're not breaking my bone. Okay, what's the bone to pick? It was my one chance at greatness, right? Where did you stay when you were in Gibraltar? I stayed by you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks for the mention. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, but we're bringing you on now. Okay, fine. Oh, okay. Now you get your whole episode. Okay. So, what's your name? My name is, my, my full name is Chanoich Zaev Roberts, but everybody knows me as Noiki. There are actually people who are in my life who, if you told them Chanoch or Chanoich, they wouldn't know who you're talking about. Right. Even when I got smich, I became like Rabbi Noiki. That's as good as it gets, right? How many like Noki food references do you get? I get Nike references a lot. The American. I, Yaakov, I had Nike. like a timer. Yeah. 
I said Yako's gonna make a Noki food reference around <laughs> four minutes in. Oh, and we're, only, we're three minutes and seven seconds in, and there's the, the Noki <laughs> you know food reference. So. Okay. Yeah. okay, so we know there's like uh, so much to talk about Gibraltar. There is, but I, 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 you mentioned like how you're a rabbi and and you have a yeshiva and 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 you're a therapist. Is that the proper word? Kind of. And we want to get into that, but like I think that you didn't foresee you getting into this type of life that you're in from younger like maybe Correct. you're a little more wild is that the word that's to put it mildly yes so so like what like what was your background like that and that got you to here okay i i, I think that's what really makes me passionate today it's a great question but i had a troubled teenage life if you could say it that way i grew up in gateshead which is an ultra religious community and I didn't find my place there 100%. And I was probably would be a teen at risk, you know, in those days, except we didn't, uh, it wasn't so well documented. And I, I didn't feel the, the passion for Yiddishkeit. I didn't, I didn't feel passionate about anything. In fact, there was a lot of negativity in, in education. I was called stupid. I was told that I was a loser. And, and I, took, I took that on. And until many years later, really a long time later, when I went and sort of rescripted. I had everything in, in a therapy session, actually. It was a Rov, who was a psychiatrist. He was amazing. And he told me, you don't have to believe everything you're told as a child. And I became, I, 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 he just said to me, you're going to go out there, you're going to change the world. And I was naive enough to believe him. <laughs> and it's so funny because as soon as you take on that, that story for yourself in your head, you become that kind of person. And my father, who's a Rebbe, there was one thing I said when I was growing up is that I'll never, ever, ever be a teacher. I won't be a Rebbe. I won't go into a high school. It's not going to happen. I'll, I knew I could speak well. I always thought maybe law, maybe whatever it was. And then one day, um, after I was newly married, and I was working with um, my father, used to learn with this lawyer from Newcastle. Newcastle is quite close to Gates. It's just across the water. And I have a massive passion for, had a massive passion for cars. And... Every time he would learn with my dad, I would sit outside and wait for him to finish. From a very young age, I was like seven or eight years old, I knew he was in because you'd smell the cigar smoke in my house. And my gemaras were open. He had the same kind of tea with lemon in it. And I would wait till he finished, and then he would take me for a ride in his car. And then after I got married, and I, I moved back to England, because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew I couldn't afford to go to Israel. Or I didn't want to start off in debt. So my wife was given a job in his law firm. And he needed someone to drive him, so I went with him to cases and whatever. And so I was, he paid me to drive his fancy cars. Can you imagine? It was like amazing. And I sat at cases with him. He was just a, um, this is probably going to be the most boring bit of the interview. He sat in front of city councils petitioning for licenses for maybe like liquor or Pizza Hut wants to serve alcohol after mm -hmm. X, whatever. It was not, wasn't glamorous, but he made a living. And, I, and he said, you could do this in a, in a heartbeat. You've learned good You can do it. No problem. And at the same time, my father, who was teaching in a high school, um, had to be absent for one of his lessons, and he asked me if I could just go in and, and babysit, you know. And I did, I went in. And I just, you know, felt all important, tw 21 years old, walking in slightly intimidated by these teenagers. And I said, right, you guys know what you need to do, just off you go, right? They had some Chazara to do or whatever, some Gemara test coming up. And I just sat there, then one guy raises his hand, like five minutes in, I'm like, oh, here we go, right? And he said to me, um, can you help me? with this piece of camera, I'm like, no, no, <laughs> right? And I said, well, I, I don't know, let's see. You know, and he starts telling me, well, your dad said that Gemara means X, Y, and Z, or saying, and in the middle, this other kid says to him, no, no, you got it wrong. You, I understand what mistake he's making. So I said to him, you wait one second, let him sit. And then after this, like crazy, the bell rang. And like everyone was into it. And I, and I, and I felt it was amazing. And I walked out and the principal was standing there. Like there was a window above the door. He said, that's it, you've got the job. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? And a few people came to me. I, w I, I had one guy who was a dropout in high school. And he, he was just low on confidence. And I said to my dad, what do I do? This, this father came to me and said, will you learn with my son? I said, no. He said, I'll pay you 20 pounds an hour. I said, when do I start? <laughs> right? It's a true story. And... I started to learn with this kid, but I felt very low in confidence. I'm not a brilliant learner myself. I enjoyed learning. I could learn a bit, but not well enough. And my father said to me, the kid needs love. He needs to feel. Look, my wife's American. She's from Atlanta. She made cookies and brought them in. And the first time you do that to an English kid, it's so embarrassing. And he's like, no, no, no. 
And then he just be, got comfortable and we treated him and I told him he's great. And this kid blossomed. And I remember very, very clearly my first apartment getting a bang on the door one evening. And I thought someone was in trouble. And it was raining a little bit and there was this little kid and he was standing by my door and he was properly crying. And he said, he said I got 100%. He had never scored well on a test before. We just did things slowly, we did it well, we did it with love. I was driving this fancy car, going with a lawyer to places, and I changed this kid's life. And I think it was like Hashem telling me right there, there you go, son, you've got two chances at life. You could do what you want. You could probably go out there and make money if you want, but you could also make an impact. And I said to myself, all that I swore at 17, I'll never teach. I made my decision right then and there. If I could, if Hashem would bless me to go into Kira of Ochinuch, or do it, I'm going to do it. And then a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from my brother who was in Koilal in Gibraltar saying we're looking for somebody to come to Jib. We're going to open some Jewish schools for the first time in history. We need a youth director. We need someone to help us out in the community. Would you come? And my wife was not happy in England, right? From Atlanta, Georgia to northeastern rainy uh, Gateshead now. And this was in 1997, early 98. I went to Gibraltar on a two-year contract. And um, I'm still there. Your wife was okay with Gibraltar over England? After England, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think if I wouldn't have done it that way, there would, wouldn't have been any chance. No way. So right before the interview, um, I, I know you because I stayed by your house one time. That, this is the second time we're ever meeting. And Nahi was asking so many questions. He was genuinely, like, genu genuinely so curious about Gibraltar. So Nahi hit, go, hit it away with any like, all, the, all these questions so, yeah, about no, Gibraltar. Uh, Nike, you showed me some pictures, which is yeah. incredible. It's for those, I guess, maybe we'll put on, on the YouTube version of this podcast, we'll put a oh, picture cool. of, of Gibraltar that you can see right now. It's pretty much a rock. That's it. <laughs> it's pretty much a rock. And people talk about the rock at Gibraltar. So <clears throat> how many how many from families are, are currently living there? So it's difficult for me to say 100%, but somewhere in the region of 150 to 200 families live there. They've wow. lived there for a long time. So it's like the same amount as Avenue L in Brooklyn. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> half L literally of Avenue L. Half maybe. of Avenue L, exactly. Maybe, yeah. But they're, they're wonderful, wonderful people. They're extremely passionate. I've got some great stories. I tell stories. I just, I live on Well, our, I think our audience loves well, stories. Well, I think anyone who has an English accent, if you don't, <laughs> if you don't tell stories and you're just, you're misusing it, and Hashem <laughs> might just pull it from you and you're going to sound like us. <laughs> you sound like a New Yorker. <laughs> Hashem, what I do there? Right. We can't tell uh, stories, you know? I, yeah. You mean being like a New Yorker, yeah. Like, I got to get coffee, man. Coffee. It's all about like, <laughs> everyone's like in your face here in New York. Now, I love coming to New York. But I also, do? Yeah, but also I love leaving as well. You know, like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a pressurized style of living. Everybody's on their horn. You know, everybody's like, everything's hap to hap. Gibraltar is perhaps the most opposite of so New could York. You, could, you, could you give us a little bit of a, I guess, take our listeners, take me through what, what that's like. I Meaning I only, I've only lived in New York, so I don't okay. know. Oh, so I shouldn't have insulted you. So no, no, yeah. it's totally, it's totally, it's fine. But I, I don't know what that means to live right. like that. Okay. So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a guest in Gibraltar and have been for 25 years, but I've, I've, my life has transformed because of Gibraltar and Gibraltar, the pace of life is slow enough that you can walk everywhere pretty much. Okay. If you want to, and I, when I go and buy my vegetables, I take my passport with me because I'm going to cross over to go into Spain. I don't have to, right? So you, you cross the frontier. Yeah, Gibraltar is, everything's within walking distance. It's two and a bit miles long, so you, you can't really go very far. But having a Jewish community, it's a Sephardic community, and they've been there for hundreds of years. And if you go back a few generations, you'll realize that there were Mukubalim there. There were some really great people there. And some of the stories I'd like to share with you today will just give you an inkling and an understanding of of the kinds of things that can happen when, when, when life slows down and crystallizes and you get a chance to think, what's it all about? I think things are simple. That's, that's what I believe. If I just look back into my childhood and see where the bits were that really got... I, I was involved in something. It was, it was fast. It was furious. It was some angry teacher needing to get through a lesson. I think if he would have slowed down, realized there's 23 neshamas over here in Klal Yisrael that are going to build legacies, and you're entrusted with them right now. You, you need to be careful. You should say to Hillen before you walk into a classroom. I'm not going to say the wrong word. Or I, ju I just feel Gibraltar's good. 
in that respect. The pace of life is conducive for growth. When, when things are stressful, you can walk five minutes and be on the waterfront. You know, you can, nothing, nothing is too difficult. People can come home for lunch, right? Mm. I give two shirim a week where the business guys come out of their offices and they get a sandwich and, and we sit in Fabrang for 45 minutes, usually something on the parish or whatever. And it's intense. It's like proper learning going on in the middle of a business day. And the lawyers are like putting the holds on, calls on hold and, and, and people are coming. You can do, it's, it's good old fashioned community life. I guess it's almost like shtetl life That's in so a sense. Cool. Yeah. And they're good people. Shul is meaningful. People are careful, you know? And imagine if you lived in a tiny house, you know, if, you, if it's messy, you're going to suffer the consequences, but you need to keep it tidy. Community matters. The people, status and money, you know, that doesn't really matter that much in a small place. It's like inspiring your own kids. They, they don't care that, like, for example, that I'm a, on stage some nights in the week singing. Or they don't care. Like, I'm dad. If, if I'm a good person to be around, they want to be around me. If not, not. And in Gibraltar, the Jewish community is respectful of those values. And if you're a good person, you'll stand out. And if you're not, you'll also stand out for the wrong reasons. Everything else just falls away. It's beautiful. It's a lot of pressure, though. In a sense. You're not, you're not blending in. You're, 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 a, you're a big part of it. That's true. That's true. You've got nowhere to hide. But in a sense, that's, I think, what Hashem wants of us. Does he want us to just blend in and hide and become like a chameleon? No, you're probably or right. He, or are we going to get called up after 120 and Hashem's going to ask us, hello, I gave you life, well, what did you do with it? So it's true that there is a certain pressure. Like if I'm not in chakras, they'll know. So in right. that respect, you know, that's you not oversleep. fun. I'm not moving there. <laughs> okay, <not> so, <laughs> no, no, no. That, it's, it's a, yeah, I hear that. It, that's yeah. a good uh, accountability, I think, is... It's a, it's a good thing. It helped me step up because I was very schwach. I mean, it has to. It's got to. There like. you go. And, and if you're going to survive, you're going to be known for who you really are. And is it, is uh, yeah. there a lot of tourism in, in Gibraltar? Tons. Yeah? Tons. Yeah, before COVID, does millions that boost, of tourists. Does, I'm sure that boosts the that's market. A, that's, a, that's a fair chunk of the, the economy, yeah. Has there been a Pesach program there yet? I don't think so. Has there been? Sorry? Has there been a Pesach program in Gibraltar yet? Um, I've been on a couple. In Gibraltar? But not like... Not like massive ones, right. not like the big ones. The big ones will will go to Spain or right. nearby Morocco. Right, Morocco. Right. It's um. So when I stayed by you on yeah. Friday, I went to town or that main you know Central Avenue Avenue J, <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating. Three separate people stopped my wife and myself and said, "Hey, could, like, do you need to be hosted for Shabbos?" And it was right. like an hour before Shabbos. I'm like, yeah. or a few hours before Shabbos. I'm like, we're fine. We're we're by the Robertses. But um, if you found yourself on that island, I hope you're hope no. You're the care people of. were so nice yeah. there. Do you could you share a story or two about? I, I don't. I, I don't know if the stories would be about the people, but well, I'll tell you a cool story. It just you've just reminded me of this now. What well, if you think about it? We don't. We know everyone in Gibraltar, of course, right? So if there's a guest in town, it is. I mean, people will swamp you and say, "Can we have you for a Shabbos meal?" Because it doesn't. It doesn't happen that often. It's a privilege to have new people at your table. I remember once. Um, being in the bakery, um, you know, and seeing people buying stuff. And I'm like, hey, 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 are you here for Shabbos? They're like, yeah. I said, uh, are, you, are you hosted? They're like, no, no, no. We're, we're eating in the hotel room. Thank you. It's fine. Proper New York accent. So I'm like, no, 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 no. You have to come to me for Shabbos. Please, I beg you, right? And, and they said, oh, are you sure? I'm like, uh, let me think for a second. Yeah, I'm sure. Come, <laughs> right? And by the way, that's a great thing for kids to see, to see that your, your house is open and it's, there's, t there's time, there's time to, 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 to enrich a quality of life, to spend with people. And, and when you really connect with people, I, I mean, therapists will tell you, that's where everything is. I think they did a study, a brilliant, brilliant study in Boston in the 1930s. They took two distinct groups of people and they took kids from the projects in the 1930s. They didn't even have running water in their houses. That's how poor they were. And they took the Harvard elite, right? And they said, we're going to map their progress. And it's a long study, and I don't want to go into it, but it's a brilliant, brilliant study, by the way. And it's still going on today. And they've got thousands and thousands of su subjects. And it wasn't just a questionnaire to see how well people did. It was trying to quantify quality of life, like to see who's, gonna, who's happiest. And it's a very, usually these kinds of studies run out of money or run out of impetus, or the guy running the study dies. And it, this one's still going on, the fourth director of the study. It's one of the most popular talks on, on TED. And... What they, what they worked out was they saw people climb the social ladder and others fall off it. They've even got one of, one of the United States presidents on their books. And they go in, they do full body medicals and CAT scans and interview family members. It's, they really keep up 
with all the people that they're monitoring. And what they found at the end of everything is the people who are happiest and actually live the longest are the people's, people who have the most meaningful relationships. Hmm. You talk about meaningful people, meaningful relationships. We're floating through this world and you hold on to those people that touched you and you made a difference to. I speak publicly in a lot of places. Once in a while, once in a blue moon, I'll get a call and someone will say to me, you've no idea, but what you said just helped me. I, I, I gave a talk in London just a few weeks ago to a crowd of people I don't know. They heard I was coming, they asked me to speak. I spoke about seven or eight times in, in, in a matter of two days. And one of the crowds was um, a group of ladies on Shabbos afternoon, a more affluent part of uh, town. And I had no idea that there was a woman in the crowd whose husband had just dropped dead. I didn't know this. And I said a story. Uh, but I might say the story later. Uh, an amazing story, a story which is tr truly, truly remarkable. And she came to me afterwards and there was like tears in her eyes and she said, Rabbi, you helped me today. That's exactly what I needed to hear. Hashem sent you. You know, what was your question again? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the nice, <laughs> you, kind people in Gibraltar. Right, so when I, I think having people around your Shabbos table and y you make meaningful connections, it, it keeps be the people, by the way, in the study who lived the longest were the people who felt their relationships were the strongest. They mattered most to people. Nothing to do with money, nothing to do with health, nothing to do with neighborhood, nothing to do with anything else. People who feel they belong. And I was thinking, that's what Yiddishkeit is, isn't it? We create communities. We, you know, if somebody's on the street and he doesn't have something to eat, that's your problem. That's my problem. He's, we're a family. It doesn't matter about the accent and it doesn't matter about our logistical locations. If there's someone in Klal Yisrael who's off the derch, it's our problem. And kids in Jib can see that. If we have a chance to have someone else at our table, it's great. I was in the bakery, I saw these people, I said, you have to come. Turns out, I, their husbands, I both knew from yeshiva, they lived, one was across the road from yeshiva. I went to see one of them last night. It's, it, it's, you make connections and it, it matters. And I guess the pace of life in Gibraltar is good for that. You have time to see family, to spend time growing the community, people step up and realize if I don't give to the community, community life will fizzle out. If we don't, if we're the not the next generation who's going to keep the Gabais going in shul or Balek Koyer or whatever it may be. So there's a beautiful program in Talmud Torah where all the kids go for a Shabbos afternoon, um, where they go for a Shabbos morning davening. They become proficient chazanim by age 10, 11, 12. Every single one of them. They sing a lot out, out loud. They can, the chazan in par excellence by, by age 13, 14, they're ready to do it. They take on bits of it. All of psychedism <laughs> is broken up. A little kid comes with a talis, steps up. He can't even reach, you know, the, the <laughs> thingy. And he steps up and he, it's, it's good old fashioned community living, but chesed and hosting is, uh, it's rare because we don't get guests that often. Is, is the community growing? Are more yeah. people moving there? Yes, it is. When I first came, there was about 70 children in the elementary school and the kids um, today there's over 150 160 so it's when the f when the, f the version of my high school started the first version of it there were three boys in a grade the rabbi's son and, and two other kids today we have nearly 50 boys in my high school wait didn't your daughter just move there my daughter just got married yes. Yes. thank you thank you thank you she moved to Gibraltar yes Wow. Isn't that crazy? That's awesome. I'll tell you something. And he's not from Gibraltar. <laughs> no, no he's he, not. Where's he from? He's from London. Okay. <laughs> but, and they met during proper COVID lockdown London, right? What was COVID like there in Gibraltar? It was tough. Was because, it? Yeah. yeah because if, can you imagine if you, if you live in a small supermarket and one person gets it, dude, you're done, right? Right. Oh, so everyone, everyone uh, was getting it. So they were very strict on, on lockdown. And... Um, lockdown was heavy and harsh and the police were on the streets and there was even curfew at night and stopping you and saying hey, where are you going I'm like I'm going to buy groceries really you know like they were they they were trying to be careful they closed the borders they didn't want people in and out I mean essential workers could come in and things like that but it was pretty rough and it think about scary. it it was it was like we live in New York is massive and correct but Gibraltar is like this tiny little island and yeah. closing that border is like very <laughs> restricting. There were people who were genuinely frightened. They said, look, if, if the border closes, 
how are we going to get food? Right. So the government came out with like, don't worry, we'll fly stuff in. And they were amazing. But there were definitely times where basic essentials were not on the shelves. And you couldn't get flour or rice or, you know, it sounds like third world. Yeah, I was about to say that. It sounds like third world problems. Uh, it, but, you know, they but survived you, quite happily. On the flip side, you, you guys have monkeys. There you go. Yeah, you do. yeah what's with that? What's with that? Mm. Top of the um, rock, right? Well, first of all, don't talk about my high school quite like that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the, the top of the rock, there's Barbary apes. The Gibraltarians now will be listening to you and saying, don't call them monkeys. Oh, They're not gosh. monkeys. Is they it safe are. to say that every single Jew in Gibraltar is going to be listening to this? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then some. <laughs> of course, That's this awesome. is, yeah. That's awesome. They're great people. You're going to come. You're gonna come it's and you're gonna visit me. It's a shame. Nah, you're gonna go back for Nah. He gets like he's now doing the Dafyomi with uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Ravelli. Now he's gonna go to but yeah, they're yeah. both good. They're good stuff. I'm not a huge traveler. Like I haven't been I I, I haven't been anywhere out of America besides Israel and Canada. Like that's it. Well, on your way to Israel, we'll stop you off. Is it? Down. Is that so? Yeah, you can fly through we Spain. Can stop, and, yeah, do people just stop, stop over in, in Gibraltar? They uh, they do. Like in in Benazmanim season, you know these Bahram that are coming and going home. How far is they, from Israel? Um, a four hour flight I mean okay, it, you could happen. do it you yeah. for sure can make it happen but on the top of the rock there are different families of wild Barbary apes monkey like thing. one of them once stole my yarmulke right really? yeah and uh, and it's a, it's a cool feature I think it's the only place in Europe where they live in the wild and then in the Bay of Gibraltar, we have pods of dolphins that also live there in the wild so it's a nice tourist attraction it's like when Hashem was creating the world he like Spent extra time creating Gibraltar and said, "This place it's going to be, be cute. beautiful." Yeah. But also, like, I'll just throwing some apes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but also spiritually, I, I, I'm going to mess it up. But there's the two oceans that connect that you make Correct. a special bracha. Very good, well done. I, I, I did it. You, yep. you took I, me there. Oh, it's true. So. I forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, what? So, in it, Gibraltar's a rock. On the one side is the Atlantic Ocean. On the other side is the Mediterranean. And when the Atlantic comes in through the Straits of Gibraltar, on the other side. On the eastern side is the Mediterranean. And where these two oceans meet, there's a there's a Shaila in Halacha. Sha'osa sa Yamagadl. What's the Yamagadl? Is it the Atlantic? Is it the Mediterranean? I think it was the Chazanish that said, the one place for certain in the world where you can stand and make the bracha is where those two oceans meet. And so he said, if you stand in Gibraltar and you you look over the Straits of Gibraltar, you can make that bracha. So I do. I do that with guests. I take them off. And, so cool. Yeah. i tell you a very cool story. Um, I got a phone call from a random... I think it's your fault, by the way. Oh, gosh. I, someone said, uh, Langu gave me your number, right? <laughs> yeah. If phone calls start so, that those way... Those are like the, the, <laughs> the, like, le, the worst words there. <laughs> Langu gave me your number. It's like... Uh, you want to know something? I'm so happy. I'm so happy. This guy called me up. I don't even know his name. I'm going to have to look him up. Um, and he said, I'm coming to Gibraltar. You know, what can I do? Shabbos. Da -da. So I hooked him up and I gave him the number of a taxi driver. This taxi driver is a friend of mine. He's just down the street from me, always uh, drinking coffee, taking tourists up the rock, right? These guys know Gibraltar like the back of the hand. And I said, well, just call my friend, you know, and if you need a taxi, he can take you, whatever. And I get a message like a few days ago from this taxi driver, right? And he says, wow, amazing people, amazing. I took them around. And I didn't know there's one place where you say a blessing. This Goisha taxi driver is <laughs> telling me. He was telling me about the blessing from the great rabbi. Here's the guy telling me <laughs> <laughs> that happened just last week. That's funny. Yeah, so you can say, you can say the bracha there. But the, to make it a bit more real and meaningful, you know, the people there, I would say, are very unassuming. You'd, you'd call them perhaps extraordinarily ordinary when you look at them on the street but they're so extraordinary if you think about it in a world which is just racing at breakneck speed and nobody really knows what's coming next and we're hopping from one fear to the next everyone's worried about something yeah. you know the media does a brilliant job at that and here's just a little oasis of calm where people really meaningfully connect connect to Hashem you know davening matters I hate to say this but one of the things that I struggle with is the speed of tefillah here, you know? Like, blink and you miss it, right? And shul, shul, the shuls are 200 years old, 300 years old. They're, I'll tell you a great story. I was giving a share once. I was talking about, I can't remember. I think it was talking about a tefillah. And this fellow batted and he says, I have, to, I have to tell you a story. And he said, I said, sure. And he said, the story happens in around 1912. It happened with his grandmother. So in the 1800s, there used to be a cemetery. There still is a Jewish cemetery up the rock. Did I take you there? 
Yes, you did. Oh, okay. I, it's near where I made the bracha, I think. Correct. Yeah, exactly. It's okay. very close to it. So there's, a, there's an old cemetery that's not been used since the, the, the 1800s. And they, they gave us a new plot next to the runway closer to Spain. And in, I, I can't remember, I think it was in the year 1815, 1850 or so, the military closed it off. And the British military, Gibraltar's a British colony, so the British military said this is a military-controlled zone, no one's allowed to come up here. And I think that the head of the military authorities said the Jews have a cemetery there, fair enough, they can come once a year to visit. And that day was Lag Boimer. And they used to come up once a year, and to this day, by the way, Lag Boimer, that cemetery is packed, everyone comes up saying to Hillim, there's Mukubalim there, there's great stories, there's an enclave of, of Tzadikim there. An amazing story It happened actually with one of them. I think he passed away late on a Friday. And the head of the Hever Kadisha got a dream the night before saying, just take me there before Shabbos, it'll be okay. And when he passed away, the Hever Kadisha said that, look, he's going to have to go in the enclosure where the tzaddikim are, but there's no way we can, there's no room, and there's no way we're going to have time to dig a burial plot. And then the head of the, that was the rabbi, and the head of the Hever Kadisha said, but I had a dream, let's take him up. They took him up the rock and they saw the land had shifted. There was like a crack in the, and the ground had opened. And they buried him right there. And to this day, you can see, like, in the enclave where the tzaddikim are, there's these two graves and another two. And in the middle is, like, a, a narrower one, and it's on a different level. There's still some great holy people there. In the 1850s, when the military uh, cut it off, so the Jewish community went once a year. This regular guy told me, his grandmother, in about 1912, has a dream. And she sees the dead people in the cemetery. And she sees these people who she knows from the previous generation. And they say to her in the dream, come and visit us, come and visit us. And she sees it quite vividly. She wakes up the next morning, she tells her husband, that was weird. It was weird. Then, you know, he says, yeah, well, weird stuff happens in dreams. And the next night when she sees it again, she gets a little bit, you know, spooked out. When it happens a third night in a row, she goes to the Rav and she says to him, they're calling us. They're calling us to say, come and visit us. And the Rav says, you know we can't. So they go, to the, they go to the president of the community, who then goes to the head of the military authority and says, look, I wonder if you grant us special permission to go up to the cemetery. We'd like to pray. And he says, okay. You know, they grant special permission. So the Rav, the president of the Jewish community, and a few of the, the head of the Hever Kedisha, and a few, I guess, of the more prominent members of the community, they go up, they go up the rock. And they go to the cemetery, and to their shock and horror, there's a platoon of soldiers there digging up Kvarim to lay a water pipe right through the cemetery. And of course, the Jewish community protests vociferously, and they, they manage to put a stop to it. And to this day, by the way, if you go to the cemetery, you can see a pipe. They, they rerouted the pipe, and it's still, it's not even under the ground anymore. And it was like the tzaddikim of, the, of yesteryear called the people from there, you know, and just said, come, you need to know, we're calling you from the other side of the grave. These stories happen with ordinary people in Gibraltar, right? Imagine if you or I got that dream. You'd be like, whoa, I have to do tshuva. To them, it's normal. Their, their relationship with Hashem is good. It's strong. They're big maminim. They really are. I think it was Rabbi Yonah that once said, don't ever say emuna pshuta. Emuna is not pashat. For the people who Hashem is real to, call it Emunah Behira. They see Hashem clearly. I think that's a very lovely way to describe Gibraltar. They are what you would call, looking at them, regular people, you know, businesses, family. But Hashem is real. They are passionate about Hashem. And Hashem is clear to them. Their davening is, is awesome. It's great. They're, they're wonderful people. We'll be right back to the episode. And one of the beauties of living out of town or in a different country is that like slow pace of life. You know, things are calmer. Um, a lot of times it's more affordable. Uh, just like a place like Gerbol, it's just it's so beautiful, such a nice community. But they don't have, here's the thing about New York, New Jersey that people don't realize as much. How lucky you, you are, yeah. You have a lot of conveniences here. Whether it's, you know, all the restaurants or all the supermarkets, all the yeshivas, but there's also, you have AMR Pharmacy. That means no matter where you are in New York, New Jersey, you have a pharmacy that you could say, beep, bop, boop, bop, 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 bop. That's the sound of you dialing. That's wow. how my phone says. I need a new phone. Welcome to the Jetsons. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you dial that on your spaceship and you get AMR. What's the number for AMR? 
eleven ten. Noiki's got to walk across a border with his passport into Spain to get a bottle of Tylenol. I like that. You just have AMR Pharmacy in your bag, and they just like. What's their leave, website? Leave it by your door. I bet you forgot their website. I no. bet not. AMRFarmRx.com. Wait. I know that like the birthday of my firstborn child. What is the birthday of your firstborn child? April 19th, 2020. I think you know AMR Farms website a little better. So there you go. Like Naki said, you could call them, you could email them, and they could help you out now. Happy birthday, Rosie. Back to the episode. Did you ever think um, during your, your younger years when, I, I guess to put it mildly, you'd say you had more of a wild childhood. Would you ever think that you'd be where you are now doing what you're doing? In a million years, I couldn't have dreamed of that. So isn't it so funny? We hear that a lot. Like people who... They they could have sworn that they were not going to do this and that they were going to be that. And then they're always sitting in this seat right across. <laughs> and it's just, there they are. Is the lesson to, to whatever you actually do want to end up doing, just say you're not doing it no matter what? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not going to make $5 million. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm just not, you know? But, yeah. but like, what? Ugh, I don't even know. Like, what's what's the common denominator like how does that work how, how does it work where you, you swear and swear that you're not going to be something you're not going to do something and then and it's like it's like <laughs> i don't know it's like it's like you're walking and a cloud is just following you over it's like how is this how is this happening well i mean if you believe in hashem and you know hashem is real it anything will happen and it doesn't really matter what we think. In fact, if we take it just a step deeper, look at the Masilis Yisrael. We're living in a world of illusion, right? And at the end of it all, I mean, what we see out there in front of our eyes, a lot of it is meaningless. It really is. And the world has tried to portray meaning in it and call it meaningful. And as Jews, I think we're always fighting that fight to strip away the external. And, and it's... Some parts of the externals are important. You have to look good. You need money to get by. Of course, certain things are important. But the be-all and the end-all, at the end of the day, who are we? What do we become? That's the essence. That's the neshama. That's the real you. The, the, the example I give to, to high schoolers, and I could do it the American version or I could do the English version. I'll do both here for uh, the benefit of our listeners, right? But I was at a baseball game. My kids are crazy Atlanta Braves fans because my wife's from Atlanta. But I hate the Braves. It, sorry? I'm a Met fan. The Braves are... Yeah, we beat you up every season. Yeah, I know. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> got a good team. This, Yeah, yeah, sometimes, <laughs> right? But, um... Naki, Naki which uh, soccer team are you a fan of? Yeah. Well, since Messi just got traded... Oh, yeah. I didn't know you'd actually know. Like, okay, very good. So, you know, you're going to Paris? Oh, uh, no. PSG? PSG. <laughs> you lost do, me. <laughs> do you know what that sound? Uh, Paris Saint-Germain. That's what it stands for. Paris's right. team is PSG. Yeah. Yeah. We'll drop the soccer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Atlanta this. Braves game that yeah. Nahi's like, bro, yeah. Braves lose. Braves. I, yeah. no. But I was at a game and it was it was close to the playoffs. It was like September-ish. It was like at the end of the summer. I used to come every summer to to, to Atlanta. And I took my kids to a game. And, and you know, some people get into it in the ball in the ballpark, right? 60,000 fans and there's a ball, a fly ball was hit. And, the, you know, the guys for the batting team were like, urging it out of the park and you know and the others are like oh, chase that ball down and two outfielders went after the ball and they they cracked heads as they you know and and, and an amazing thing happened in the stadium it just went crack you could hear that crack when these two players were like both looking up at the fly ball and both running for it and 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 in one second the game became valueless and are these guys going to be okay became the most important thing. In the, and, and it fell silent. A, a similar thing happened in a, in a soccer game in England where a, a soccer player called Fabrice Mwamba just, just collapsed with a cardiac arrest on the field. And when it became clear, soccer is much more vicious in England, yeah. right? The, the, the shouts from the stands against the referees and the other players is, is vicious, right? And these thugs are, you know, and then whether a guy's going to live or die, all of a sudden the score, the game, the color, of, it's meaningless. I think it's a great metaphor for Hashem will put you where he needs you to be. Whether you say you'll never be a teacher or not, it's irrelevant. Who are you? And Hashkoch Pratis means you're not calling the shots. You can try as best you can. Yeah, look, you can shirk your responsibility for sure. But you can't run away from your, your destiny. This is where you're going to be. I think it's also it's interesting just thinking about it a little bit more. When, when someone says, when they're, let's say, younger, when they say, I am not going to be a Rebbe. I'm not going to be a Rebbe. It's like, 
well, why are you saying that you're not going to be that? <laughs> yeah. You're obviously, it's obviously in someone's well, mind. A lot of times it's in the family. Okay, you know, so take a different know. example. I don't know. It's no, like, no, it's true, true. Yeah, you're saying. It's like, that's <laughs> literally what I It's said. like a thing that you're, you're, you're focusing that you're not going to be. You could run, but you can't hide. Absolutely. Some right. things that are meant to be are just going to happen. There you go. And you're going to fight it and say, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. But like, so by the way, your five million dollars is either coming or not coming. Irrelevant of what you said just now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and that and that's this, you one, know. Of our, one of our listeners is gonna be like, you know what, Aki? Just because you said you're not, here's here's five million dollars. There you go. I hope he's listening. Yes, or, or she. she. I was just thinking that. Uh, Noiki, when I maybe you'll feel uncomfortable to say this, but you said a lot of stuff to me, a lot of stories and inspiration that Shabbos was about you, like I don't know, five years ago. Yeah. There's one particular story, and I think it's it, it makes sense for, with what you just said now that maybe you could share. I don't know if it's like a very private thing, and I'll reference it. Hit me. Cigarettes. Oh, okay. I'll say it. Yeah? I'll say it. It's it's not a comfortable story to share. That's why I'm asking. And maybe I'll offset it. So you're so kind for asking on the air. No, yeah. we'll, yeah. <laughs> nah, we'll edit you're it. so kind. I'm talk. so cool. <laughs> we'll edit so, it. You want to know something? The more real this interview, I think the more it'll touch people listening. Yeah. And the more staged, the more wooden it'll feel. So I appreciate it. And I will share it. And... I'm not comfortable, it, it, it irks me, and I feel it wasn't even my place, and so many times in history I've gone through that story in my head. Did I do it right, did I not do it right? And I really believe, with Hashem's help, I think I did the right thing. I was, I was Gibraltar, to give this story some context, is, is pretty much like a duty-free shop in, Amer in, in, in an airport, right? There's no duty on cigarettes, there's no duty on alcohol, it's much cheaper um, there than most places in the world. And I, I wasn't in Gibraltar very long, I mustn't, it could even have been in my first year that I was there. And I got a phone call, if I'm not mistaken, it was late on a Sunday night. And a guy said to me, hi, this is X, Y, and Z. And I, I said, no, not ringing any bells. I don't know who you are. He's like, yeah, okay, it doesn't matter. I know who you are. That's never a comfortable thing to hear, you know, late at night. Like Liam you know? <laughs> yeah, we're listening in. We got, and, and he said, is it possible you can come meet me now? I said, is it, is it urgent? He goes, yeah, yeah. It's urgent. That's where are you? He was actually next to the runway in Gibraltar. The runway in Gibraltar is a cool piece of information. There are like railroad barriers that come down when the plane has to land because the plane lands across the road that we drive through into Spain. So he said, I'm right by the runway. That's okay. So I, I, I have a little motorbike. So I went down there and I met this guy and then I recognized him. I know the family he married into in England. And it pains me to say this, but he was what you would call a from guy. Okay, pay us, be a yeshivish, right? And if that's what qualifies as yeshivish, right? But he, and he said, I need your help. So I'm like getting, getting ready in chesed mode. Of course, what can I do for you? And he says, I bought a camper van. Does that make sense? Like a, you know, yeah, like like yeah RVH type thing, right? And he says, well, there's going to be, we're going to replace the bottom in it. It's going to be a fig. And we're going to put cigarettes in it. We're going we're gonna to smuggle them across the border. And I'm going to make a fortune. I'm, I'm maybe 22 years old, something like that. And he looks at me and says, I just need someone to buy the cigarettes every day, store it in a house, I'll do the rest. I'll just once a month, I'll come, I'll take it out your house. And he was offering me some exorbitant amount of money five per month dollars. to do, what? I said $5 million. Okay, I'm it wasn't $5 million, but mm -hmm. uh, It was a lot of money. It was, it was well more than a regular salary mm -hmm. a month to do his dirty work for him, but maybe even legally, I don't even know you know, buying uh, cartons of cigarettes, holding them in boxes, and then he can come and take them. And legal or otherwise, I just looked at him and instinctively something took over inside of me. And I just looked at this older, more established guy and I said to him, do you believe in God? Do you believe in Hashem? And it's like, this was not the setting for a Musa Shmuz, right? Mm -hmm. And he looked at me like with disdain, so to speak. I said, answer the question. And he kind of shifted from foot to foot. And he said, yeah. I said, do you also believe that on Rosh Hashanah, Kodesh Baruch Hu fixes exactly what you're going to make for the year? He's like, yeah. I said, then this isn't it. This, this, this can't be right. No, I won't help you. And I walked away. And then a plane landed and hit his van. <laughs> <laughs> you wish. But unfortunately, if, I think he spent some time in jail for other smuggling offenses. And it just doesn't make sense to me. 
It doesn't make sense. If it's, if it's wrong and it's not right and it's illegal, don't do it. Who are you going to trick? I, I understand people feel desperate at times. I, I get that bit. But that's not the answer. And maybe let's offset that story with a much nicer story. I'll tell you. Yeah. I was going to say for that one guy who's smuggling cigarettes out of Gibraltar right now, it's super awkward. <laughs> yeah. He's like listening to this podcast. <laughs> He's now. like, oh my gosh. Maybe I'll listen to music. They're onto me. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it just isn't right. And you could take it even further. You know, how many guys make it to Israel and go for yeshiva or go to Koil and whatever, and they're putting, you know, too many cartons in their suitcase. I, is that the way Hashem wants it? I don't know. It's you know each for the fi- I read a finer speak once, and he has uh, his son, uh, Shai Finer, is, you know, special needs, and he has to deal with all of the, the special ed and the government services, and he was once told, you know, just if you just write this down on the, on the thing, it, it'll be much easier. And he looked at them and he said, that's lying. Right. I can't, I can't lie. Right. So you know, but... It's a loophole. Like everyone does it, and and yeah, it'll, it'll just you. Know, yeah, nothing's gonna happen. It's they right. expect you to do it. He said, right. But it's lying. I cannot lie. No, I, mean, I love people like that. Yeah, it's not Yosha. What's yeah. the What's the uh, nice story? Okay, I'll tell you. I mean, there are so many great stories that I love sharing because I also do like corporate speaking. I do speaking at events for non-Jews and what have you. I just think if you live like a good person, it's better for you. And, you know, you have to find that. Maybe Gibraltar's good at just like, there's a great word in Spanish called tranquilo, which is related to tranquil, right? It's yeah. just, there's a pace of life. It's also maddening, by the way, at certain times. I've called up companies that are saying, look, my roof is uh, it's leaking. I need, I once called a company called emergency 24-hour repairs or something like that. I said, I need somebody now. I have a leaky pipe. They're like, yeah, we could, it's Thursday. We could send someone on Monday. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's it's like a dollar store and it's like $15. And yeah, $20. right? Dollar so, store. So sometimes the pace of life has its its negative thingy. As Jews, we should be pushing. We should be up. We should be, you know, we've got to do in life. And, and the, tranquilo can, the tranquility can affect us negatively, but we can also use it positively. And, and the, the, the nice story I was going to say is it, it's an incredible story. So I mentioned to you that I, I give shiurim and young couples shiurim and the working boys lunch and learns and what have you. And it's always tricky when you're a speaker if you know someone in the room is struggling with a certain thing and you've got a story or you've got a whole shear based on this one topic and this one point. You're like, it's going to sound so cheesy coming from me. He knows I'm talking to him or about him or I'm trying to avoid him, you know, because there was one couple in, in my community that were childless and... They weren't just childless for like a few years. It was 15 years mm. they were childless uh, to the point where, and I've, I've been given permission by them to share the story, um, to the point where doctors that they had gone to were just saying, it's time to give up now. It's not going to happen. And there was only one place in the world where the doctors weren't giving up, and that was Israel. But everyone else, like in the Jews don't, don't give up. But in London, throughout Spain, Valencia, Madrid, Malaga, everywhere they went, they were told, we're, we're sorry, you know. And I, I keep talking about tefillah. I, I, it's, our, it's our connection to Hashem. It's our one time we pick up the phone and we say, Tati, I'm here. I need you. That's what Machal Kel Chaim Bechesed means. Hashem I couldn't even open my mouth if you didn't let me. Gibraltar are good at davening. They're good, right? And I, I like that. And this story happened just a few years ago. And I'm going to get some of the details wrong, but I'm going to show you something afterwards. I actually have it on my phone and on my laptop here. I brought it in to show you. There was one part of Yom Kippur davening. I think it's around Mincha time, before Mincha. It's called Et Sha'are Ratzon. Now, of course, Gibraltar is a totally Sephardic community. We have an Ashkenaz minion for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So I wasn't there to see this happen. But apparently, there's this one guy whose family have always had the minag to open the Arana Kodesh for this tefillah of Eish Shari Ratzon. And two brothers came up to say one stanza each of this tefillah. And of these two brothers... One is a, a young lawyer. He's been, he was in my, he was, him and his wife were youth, were 16 years old when I first came to Jib. They're now married with children. And his brother, this, the lawyer, and his brother, who's, who was childless. And painfully so for so many years. And in a small community, it gets magnified. Like everybody's families are growing. You know everyone's kids. 
and this one couple show up to Shul Shabbos morning every single Shabbos. Child, it's, it's a, if it doesn't touch your heart, you're not human. And this third guy who opens the Arna Kodesh is also a lawyer, by the way. He opens Arna Kodesh. They say one stanza each, and then he goes back to his place, I think, for Shemayin Esra of Minchan Yom Kippur. And then he sees a glowing light coming from the Arna Kodesh. And in his vision, and I, I keep pegging him on asking him, how did the vision manifest itself? Like, what did he see? But he sees in the Arna Kodesh, he sees a baby. And he sees himself going and taking this glowing baby boy. And he sees himself picking it up and going to the childless father and handing him the baby. This is in his, his Shmun Esra. And it spooks him. And he tells no one. Matzi Yom Kippur, he goes home. And he writes a letter. He writes his experience. I have the letter here with me. Do you want to read it? You want me to? Yeah, why not? Let me get this computer. Yeah. Oh, sorry, for those just listening in. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm opening my computer. And here is the letter. Okay? You guys can see it? Yeah. yeah. I'm happy to share it with you afterwards as well. Sure. Okay? I'll read it to you. It's dated. He's out of Tishri. So it's like literally the day after Yom Kippur. And he writes as follows. Mincha Yom Kippurim. And you can scooch here and see that I'm reading it word for word, yeah, right? I opened the Hechal, Gibraltar style, right? As traditionally done by my family for years. The two boys' names, Abby and Ellie, Abby's the fatherless one, Ellie's the lawyer, sang Echa Are Ratzon, and I joined them for a stanza each. During Amida of Mincha, I saw myself back at the Hechal with Abby and Ellie at the bottom of the steps. There are a few steps just in front of the Arna Kodesh, very big, beautiful Arna Kodesh. A very bright light came out of the Sefer Torah, and a baby radiating all over with light came out of the Hechal. I picked up the baby in my arms and came down the steps and handed the baby to Abby, who smiled in bewilderment. He finishes the letter by saying, Be'ez was Hashem, that this was a sign of good news to come for Abby and Deborah. And he signs it. Now, wait, stand there for a second. He takes the letter and he seals it. He signs his, letter, his name on the seal. Can you see his yeah. signature on the seal? And then he tapes it up. He gives the letter to the brother of the childless guy, Ellie. And he asks him, he says, look, I, I want something to be kept, but I want you to witness that there's a letter in here and I want you to sign on the seal as well, if you don't mind. And then I'm gonna cover it. Can you sign this letter? And Ellie had no idea what was in the letter. No idea. He signed the letter and they put it away for a year. That year, he had a baby boy. Ooh. Against all the odds, there was no medic. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details. The comment that I make on that story is they don't say those stories about you and me. This is, if you meet the people involved, and you, you're coming to Gibraltar, right? Yeah. yeah. There you go. So you have to meet these people. I'm in. You'll see, you'll call them what, what ordinary people. And I, and I, I, I struggle to say it because they're so not ordinary. On the outside, they just look ordinary. But how does that happen to a regular guy who goes and works nine to five? And these people are holy people. They're great, great people. But tefillah for them is amazingly important. Hashem is real. They're, they wouldn't dream of putting stuff on a form that's not. They, they, they're good people. It's just simple. I, I've, I once saw a, a line saying, anybody can make the simple complicated. Making the complicated simple, now that's creativity. Now it's a great line, but I really think it's true. Life is simple. Hashem gave you life. He gave you a set of rules, and he said, play by these rules, and it'll be good for you. And, and we go and complicate it. Like, we, we have to talk about what's the best restaurant, and it has to be the hark. And the, strip all of that nonsense away. It's, the other metaphor that I give to my students is, I say, imagine you're going to have to sit a final. So it's a big exam. But you know what? Just to be easier on you, I'll give you... I'll give you a limited number of questions. It'll only be five or six questions, okay? And then on top of that, to make it even easier for you, I'll give you those questions in advance. You know exactly what questions are coming. How dumb do you have to be to fail that exam? Agreed? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what's gonna happen to us? We're gonna go at the end of this life and Hashem is gonna take your neshama and he's gonna ask you a series of questions. Like, Nosasa v'natata ba'emunah, Tzipisa li Yeshua, Kavata itim latar, were you honest in business? 
Were you actively waiting for Mashiach to come? Did you make, were you koveya itim latoya? These are not rocket science questions. How dumb to fail the first eight? You can't. And I, I, I don't know. I just think Gibraltar has been good for me at, at reassessing these values. The pace of life in other parts of the world, New York included, it's, it's more tricky. I think, I think, I really think that people are going to listen to this and consider moving there. Oh, it's, it's, it's you save hard, money on taxes, right? It's, it's a hard move. But no, I don't, I'm not asking for people to move there. I'm really <laughs> but, not. But I just think but that we could. You, but <laughs> you don't have to. But like, it's, it's, it sounds really tempting for, for so many that are living the lives, the, the pace of life in New York or any other yeah. major city. What you're, what you're saying is like a, sort of a dream it is but it's okay so i i i feel i have to be careful here i'm not saying that it's it's easy to do that right. in jib you still have to work on yourself you know getting up for davening being an honest person pushing hard in your own Torah growth and your own it's all about your relationship with hashem that's ultimately what we're doing here being close to hashem that's good for me and the reason why it's good is because you know shama is a it's a portion of god and the, the, the closer it can be to plugging into the mainframe and getting its juice, the better you'll feel. As a therapist, I've sat in front of clients, suicidal, super wealthy, super... And I remember one line from somebody who was genuinely ready to end their lives. And I, I can't give so many details away, but if I say uber wealthy, ultra high net worth, I, I'm... Yeah, you know, a billionaire, a millionaire, whatever. A lot, right. many times. And he said to me a great line. He said, "My, I've got no dreams left anymore. You know, like everything I've dreamed of, everything that the media portrayed, I've had it, been there and done that. And it's almost like Shlomo HaMelech saying all the parties, all the houses, all the, I had it all, all the women, all the money. It doesn't, it doesn't give meaning. It doesn't make something meaningful. A party d will never do that. But doing something meaningful, like what you guys do, does give life meaning. I'm not saying to everybody, all of a sudden, up sticks and move. But in you can create an, ace, an oasis of calm in here. Mm, Shmona Esra should be that. Okay, here's a great story. Do I still have time? Yeah. Sure. For stories? Yeah. I'm hoping to, to, to get rid of all of like, the awkward questions and just bombard you with stories. And like, <laughs> oh, we're out of time. I'm like, okay, see ya. <laughs> you know? But here's a, a great story. And I use this a lot. It actually comes from... Um, uh, Emuna, when it comes to Shemitah. Shemitah is the great Emuna tester, right? But some people do well with it and other people struggle with it. And when it came to Shemitah, the Akarosh Baruch just promised everything would be okay. And the question is, it says, um, if you don't grow, you'll make a bumper crop, right? But before that already, the Pasuk says, Hashem says, you'll, you'll dwell securely, you'll be okay. And if I'm not mistaken, Rashi there says, that which basically means you'll eat just a little bit and from your regular crop that you make in the sixth year, you'll be okay right the way through Shemitah. So you'll have a regular amount of crop. You'll just eat a tiny bit and be satisfied and that one thing will stretch right the way throughout the sixth year, throughout the Shemitah year and throughout the eighth year until you can reap a crop. And the question is, why the two brachas? A bumper crop or a meager crop, but it'll just last longer. And I heard the following story, and I think it's so, so applicable to every single person. I, and I say this in all of the places I go to, the corporate, non-Jewish events, and, and the Jewish places. Imagine two people, okay? We'll call one Reuven, we'll call one Shimon, right? We know these kinds of people. Reuven is the eternal optimist. He is Mr. Buzzing with energy, always upbeat, things go wrong. He looks for opportunity in the, in the challenge, wherever it may be. Everything he's going to say is going to be upbeat. It's going to be energetic. It's powerful. And Shimon is exactly the opposite. He's like Mr. Dower, Mr. Negative, nothing's good enough. Even in the stuff that's going on that's good, they'll pick holes in it, and right? And there are, there, those people exist, they really do. And imagine the story takes place in the early 1900s when they're both living in the middle of nowhere. And they're both regular 30-year-old somethings, plodding along in life, you know, doing okay. And they get a call to the sheriff's office because some old uncle of theirs that they didn't quite know very well and the way out west passed away and he was a super wealthy guy and the two living relatives next of kin is these two cousins and these two they don't get along with each other they never speak to each other mr positive can't stand the negativity and negativity can't stand mr upbeat they never talk they live on the opposite sides of town but they both get the same information 
that they are now wealthy. Sign on the dotted line, you take your treasure home. And there was this massive treasure chest which was left to these two guys. So, of course, Ruvain looks at it and goes, wow, that's my $5 million that I was talking about. Just dropped out of the heavens. Here it is. And he signs on the dotted line and he goes, I'm rich. I'm like super rich overnight. This is amazing. And he goes home. And he sits this massive thing on his desk and he pours himself a whiskey and he goes, ah, lechai into this new life of mine. It's amazing, I'm gonna live great. The other guy, Shimon on the other side of town, like comes home and he draws the blinds and he locks the doors and he thinks, wow, this is gonna get me killed. I'm gonna get mugged. Family find out about it, they're gonna ask me for loans all the time. Nope, I'll never know who's my real friend anymore. This is just a life of problems sitting on my desk right here. Well, there you go. There's positivity and negativity in a, in a nutshell. They both think to themselves, but what am I going to do with this now? I'm, I'm 30. Like, what should I do? Just go out and smoke cigars and play golf? That, that's not meaningful. Ruven thinks to himself, you know, I'm going to put this away. I'll take a little something right now, a few gold coins. But I'll put this away and I'll retire when I'm 40 or 45. I'll sail the world. But for now, why don't I go back into the business world and see if I can make it with this massive safety net of knowing if I don't, I have endless amounts of wealth anyways. So Reuven decides to himself, he's gonna bury his treasure. And he thinks to himself, I just need a good landmark and I need to know where it is. And he looks at his house and he sees his backyard and he says, great, you know what, 10 paces due north from the back of my house, I'll dig a hole, Shalom al Yisrael, there we go. And so he does. So he goes and gets a shovel out of the garage, he goes into the house, picks up this thingy, goes 10 paces to the back of it, north from the back of his house, digs this massive hole and he, and he, he buries his treasure. And he covers it all up. It was an afternoon of work, back breaking, whatever. Comes back in and has another whiskey. And he goes, ah, life is great. Shimon on the other side of town is like living in fear that any knock at the door is some guy with a knife and he's going to die. So for the next three or four days, he is, he can't eat, he can't sleep. He's racked with worry and he doesn't know what to do with this massive hunk of treasure which is on his table. And he thinks and he thinks and he thinks to himself and, and it's, it's pig and every creak in the, the, you know, the wind and the, the shutters, it's dry. He's, he's ready to die. The guy's a bag of nerves. And he thinks to himself, what am I going to do with this treasure? And ultimately, he comes to the same conclusion as Ruvain does. He thinks it makes sense to bury the treasure. No one will find out about it. At least I'll have the safety net of knowing I have it, have it to dig up if I need it. And so he does that, but he thinks to himself, what if someone sees me burying the treasure? That's gonna be crazy. So for another two or three days of worry, he's trying to figure out what to do and how best to bury this treasure and not be discovered. And eventually, after another week of worrying and lack of sleep and not eating, he thinks, I need a dark, rainy, stormy, misty night. A bit like last night in Brooklyn, right? <laughs> it was like, you see the weather last night? Yeah. It was pretty it was, crazy. It was awful. Like, yeah. I, I just think it was, I was in Brooklyn for the first time on my trip here. I thought it was Hashem telling me, welcome to Brooklyn, Nike. Welcome yeah. to Brooklyn. Anyhow. I, it's not that much better when it's sunny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get killed for that. We're not yeah. going, yeah. We're not going into that. <laughs> yeah. There's good in every place, right? My email is Yaakov. Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I went to a vault last night. of somebody very meaningful to me. So rain or no rain, it was a great trip for me. And thank you for having me on this morning because that was last night and I decided to oh, do it on my sorry. way in here. So it was awesome. But anyhow, he waits for this dark, rainy, stormy, misty night. And he says, I'll wait till the dead of that night and I'll wear all black and a hood and everything. The only problem for him was he had to wait till that kind of night comes along. And from the beginning of getting this treasure until that dark stormy night, it's like three and a half weeks. And this guy, is Im he's hardly eaten. He's way sleep deprived. His brain's not functioning well, but he says, I need a landmark. I'm gonna bury the treasure. Where should I go? And he says, okay, 10 paces due north from the back of my house seems like a good landmark. Okay, I'll do it. And he goes out the back of his house and he takes these 10 steps. Every step he's looking over his shoulder. Am I doing a good job? Is someone seeing me? Am I gonna die? You know, Mr. Negative. Eventually he digs a hole, buries his treasure, comes back home and worries some more. Did he do the right thing or not? On the other side of town, by the way, this guy Ruven is whistling to work every single day, a beautiful skip in his step, but he made a massive error because he had a nosy neighbor and his neighbor was a thief. And on the very first afternoon where he put his treasure in the ground, his neighbor saw him and thought, hmm, interesting, I wonder what's going on over there. And that very same night, the first night that Ruvain was a billionaire, he lost it all. His neighbor creeped over in the middle of the night, dug up, dug up a hole, 
checked what it was, took it and left town. And Reuven always wondered why his neighbor left without saying goodbye. Shimon on the other side of town, by the way, even though his treasure is now buried, he can't live with himself. Because after he buried it, he worried some more, did he do the right thing? And after another two or three sleepless nights, he's still too scared to go out on the street. He hasn't, he, he's like in a wreck. He thinks to himself, I must get back to life. He must. He goes back out on the street looking over his shoulder, super nervous, self-conscious. But his quality of life is just not there. It's just not there. And after another month or so, he decides to himself, he can't carry on like this. He'll die. He'll just kill himself. So he decides he's going to dig up his treasure one more time just to check that it's still there. If it's still there, he knows he's done a good job and he'll rest more easy. But the one problem is he can't just go and dig up the treasure whenever he wants. He has to wait for a dark, stormy, rainy, misty night, right? And that only comes along another two or three weeks later. So by the time he gets into his garden to recheck if his treasure's there, like three months have gone by. And the guy is, is a wreck. He's hardly a human being. And when he takes his shovel and he said, where did I bury my treasure again? It was a nice round number. It was back of my house. He says 20. It was 20 paces from the back of my house, wasn't it? And he walks 20 steps and he digs for his treasure and of course he finds nothing. He finds nothing. He goes home. And when he's dug the, 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 the hole deep enough, he he's like vomits. He's so sick to his stomach that he had wealth and he threw it away. He had a safety net and it's now gone. And he cries himself to sleep that night. And he says, well, at least I'm not going to get mugged anymore. And end of story. And if we, if we just pause those two lives, let's, we'll, give it, we'll, sp we'll say both of them get on the Titanic and they both die, right? At 38 years old. Isn't it true to say, and this is the punchline, and this is the line that I love the most. Isn't it true to say, Ruvain lives the, leaves this world penniless, living the life of a multimillionaire. And Shimon leaves this world a multi-multimillionaire but having lived the existence of a penniless pauper. Isn't that true? Yeah. When I say that story, someone says, hey, where did it take place? There's some unburied treasure, right? <laughs> <laughs> but if, if we have to go there, let's, let's talk about this for real for a minute. You wake up in the morning, and of your own volition, you can get out of bed. You, you can get up. There's a roof over your head. There's, you've got clothes. You're not blind. You can see your legs work. If you're struggling with this concept, Go to a hospital ward and look at a kid with cancer. Go, go and tell me you can't find it in your day to make my da'ani a meaningful minute. Excuse the pun. Tell me. I, I went and spoke for Kids of Courage a number of times I went on these trips. It's mind-blowing how positive these kids are in wheelchairs, struggling with regular everyday tasks. Some of them can't feed themselves, certainly can't wash themselves, can't clothe themselves. And they are so appreciative of a day of life. It mocks us. How dare we get up and complain? When we wake up in the morning, I, I saw a great quote from, if I'm not mistaken, it was the head of Santander Bank in, in, in Portugal, whose daughter put out a tweet saying, my father, for all of his private jets and all of his net worth, struggled with something that we all get for free. And he died of COVID and he couldn't breathe. He's, and she said something like, be grateful for the air you have, or, or something on those lines. And, and that hits you, like that's so impactful. I guess the pace of life in Gibraltar helps with this concept, that if you wake up and you have your basic needs, you're a wealthy man. You are a really wealthy man, but that's a mindset. Whether it's actually there or not is ultimately irrelevant. If you've got gifts that are priceless, and we have them, let's be honest. I'm not saying life is problem-free, and I'm not saying life is, is hunky-dory in New York or in Gibraltar. We, we all have stresses. But if we can bu buy those minutes, if we can find that time, I don't know, Tfil is, is a meaningful connection thing to Hashem. Yeah, my students tell me it's so difficult, we've got to do it every day. True. But if today's the day where your life depends on it, and you know it, you'll, you'll daven with that little bit extra oomph. If your life has just been saved, it, it, it'll be more meaningful. That meaning, I think we have to create. I think that's our duty. And in, in the craziness of a busy world, it's really hard to make, to make the noise stop, and for us to stop and focus. But that's, as Jews, what we're supposed to do, I think. And this isn't rocket science. This is simplifying Judaism. This is, this is what we're supposed to do. And you can do it, and I can do it, and, and we have to do it. 
And uh, that's one of my favorite stories. Well, I love that story. I, I love that story. It's your TED Talk. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask you. I mean, I, I think I would say tefillah is your favorite mitzvah. We, we typically ask that question. But, but I what's think a you, favorite mitzvah? Is, if it's not, that, that, then answer it. But if it is, then I think you I would say tefillah. And there's, there's, uh, there's other great mitzvahs, easy ones. Like Shabbos is, is awesome. Yeah. The busier my life gets. And unfortunately, there are, there are difficult things in there as well. As a therapist, as a rabbi, you know, there, there are tougher things to do when, when you typically get consulted when things are not going well. And I'm, I'm a very soft person. I carry that in my heart. And it, it's difficult. And Shabbos is the day where, you know, like Hashem says, I, I got this. You know, I created the whole world. I run it minute to minute. But yeah, tefillah is very, very meaningful to me. Shabbos, I love like crazy. And weirdly, Kiddush Levana also. Why? Kiddush? I don't know. I, 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 it's funny. Kiddush Levana is a bit of a thing in Gibraltar. Everyone sings it together. They sing a lot of stuff together. It's very beautiful. If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, there was a story with Rav Pam, Zechariah Nebracha. He, I think, I think there's somewhere that says if a person says Kiddush Levana, they won't die a Misa Mashuna that month. Right. If I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. right? So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah, an concept. ultimately it's a it's a great shmirah for all of us, and we only get the mitzvah once a month, so we should make the most of it, and you know say it say it with passion. And here we are. It's like such a weird thing, blessing the moon. I mean, like, like it's a bit quirky mm -hmm. from an outsider's point of view, but it's a measure of the passion that of, of Jews have for Hashem. And if I'm not mistaken, Rapan was taken into hospital towards the end of his life and he asked for his bed to be on the, the wall next to the window of the east side, whatever it was. And he did it so he could say Kiddush Lavana. When he passed away, they found that some orderly had moved his bed mm. and he didn't say Kiddush Lavana. So yeah, Tefillah for sure, one of my favorite mitzvahs. Um, Shabbos I love, but Kiddush Lavana is also like... If you can sit down with someone from history who's no longer alive, spend an hour with them, schmooze with them, eat with them, chill with them, who would it be? I'm going to be so boring here, probably. I'm not good at this at all. But feeling a responsibility for Klan Israel, I'd love to talk to Moshe Rabbeinu because, and I'm sure everyone would say that, Avram Avinu, Moshe Rabbeinu, yeah. I once asked that in a classroom, by the way, and some kid instinctively put up his hand and said, Hitler. I'm hmm. like, what? He's like, yeah, but I'd want to meet him as a baby and I'm going to kill him. <laughs> 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 Which I thought was quite a creative answer we from a 14 year old. That answer, right? Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> um, but I love the drasticness of you, like Moshe, like that's one way of thinking of it, yeah. or like killing Hitler. As a baby. As a baby. Wow. Yeah, and then we had a whole, it was a Gemara lesson, and then we got into a whole debate as. Interesting Gemara lesson. Right? <laughs> Don't I, my headmaster guy's gonna listen? I was Manal for a number of years and I stepped down, but because I like doing more Kahila work or whatever. So the guy I work with now right, really pushes me to teach more and do more and do more. And I, I, I love connecting with the teenagers, they have to know they're great. Hashem loves them, Hashem couldn't care less about their hairstyle right now, or the football <laughs> score from last night, or how drastic the Olympics went. He's not interested in that, he cares about you, he believes in you because. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm good to go for today. And all that teenage nonsense, he doesn't care about. Um, we, we spent a whole lesson talking about would you have the guts to kill Hitler as a baby? <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to Yeshiva. That sounds fun. <laughs> Everyone who's listening is thinking about that right now. I I'm getting into trouble right now. So as we wind down, we, we, we'd like to ask two, like a flip side of a question. I'll ask it one way, Nachi will ask it the other way. I'm going to ask, what's the best advice that you've ever received? Probably um, the best advice I, I got was probably the reverse of the worst advice I got. Okay. Was that going to be your birds of one stone? Go <laughs> okay, for it. Okay. Okay. Make I, my I, job easy. So, great. I, I struggled a lot with, with being told negative stuff when I was growing up. And I think maybe that was just the style of Chinuch in those days. Maybe it was repressively English. I don't know. But, you know, being told that I was a guy. I remember being called. I did something wrong. I was, I was called a guy. Well, that's factually not true. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. But when you, you tell that to like a you're an young, alien. You, when Christian. you tell that to an impressionable young child, they feel yeah, they feel that it becomes real. I was called a loser. I was I was I remember being told by one person I would never amount to anything, so I shouldn't bother trying. And I, I walked out. I'll tell you something which may sound totally weird to you, but I cannot tell you how how real this was. When I left school at 14 years old, I was 100% sure no one would marry me because I was a worthless piece of garbage. I remember that. That's what was, was given to me. 
consciously or subconsciously, knowingly, unknowingly, mistakenly, I'm Michael, everybody. I've got no problem with that. I really feel, by the way, give it some shlemus, Hashem made me feel this empty and low. Then gave me this passion and fire. And he said, well, you've, you've experienced both those things. Go out in the world and it's like sometimes, take that. You, know, you yeah. gotta jump on a trampoline to get lower to get higher. Absolutely. You're over right. too, by the way. You're like, I'm never being a rabbi. I'm never getting married. <laughs> yeah. No, but that was next? At 14, that was real for me. And then when I, when I, you got I married found, young, no? Sorry, I did. I got married very young. Yeah. <laughs> 17? <laughs> no, no, 20, 21. But when I, when, when eventually that script was rewritten and there were people who invested in me and said, are you nuts? Worth, what are you talking about? And they lied to me on the other side. They said, you are so talented, you're gonna go out there and change the world. I remember the first time I gave a speech. Um, I was in shul, I was 21 years old. This is a great story about our current president of the community, Mr. Chaim Levy, an amazing, amazing Askan. He's a top lawyer, runs a huge firm. You should see how he davens. You should see how he dies. He cries. It's wonderful. There's no stolz. There's no shtick. There's no look at me. I'm senior partner. No. I'm, I'm I'm standing humbly in front of Hashem. It's Musa. It's beautiful. If you came to Gibraltar and only saw that, I would say it's worth it. But and I, can I tell you a great story about him? Sure. Really cool story. Okay. Our current chief minister, the current prime minister of Gibraltar, used to be a lawyer who worked in. How long do I have? Uh we're winding down soon. Oh, sh- uh, okay. I'll tell you a quick joke about me and speaking, right? So somebody once gave me, I was speaking somewhere in America, I can't even remember where, and they said, can you tell us about your speaking style? So I said, yeah, sure. I was giving a speech once, and a guy, I was in shul, it's like my big drusher, you know, and this guy's like stands up in the middle and stretches and walks out. And I was like so hurt. I went, I saw him in the street later, and I said, dude, I was in the middle of speaking. Why did you, why did you walk out? He said, yeah, Rob, I'm so sorry. I needed to get a haircut. I said to him, you couldn't have had your hair cut before I spoke. He said, Rabbi, before you started speaking, I didn't need a haircut. <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's my speaking style. Right? <laughs> but the current chief minister used Levy. to be a lawyer in this, this, this man's office, Mr. Levy. And all the Goyim know that when he has a big question, he consults Gadoilin. And apparently all the partners of this law firm were meeting. And there was a question, which direction the company's going to go, what we're going to do, certain clients, da-da-da. Unanimously, the Goyim around the table said, you ask your rabbi, whatever he says, we'll do. He's now the current chief minister of Gibraltar and has a recognition of Jews consult with their great rabbis and whatever they say they do. You know, I, I was in shul Shabbos afternoon between Mincha and Mariv, where there was traditionally a speaker who would come to give a few words of chizuk, right? And the, the guy wasn't well, didn't show up. And this man looked at me. I was so fresh. I was so green. I was like 21 years old, never given a speech before. And he says, you, go ahead, speak. I'm like, to the whole shul? Sh- no, no, I can't do that. And then a very aristocratic gentleman came over to me and said, young man, I'm tra- traveling this week. If you don't speak now, it's possibly the only words of Torah I would hear all week. Right? Older man. And that's it. I was cornered, right? So I got up and I spoke. And I was more nervous than nervous. And if I tell you my voice was like, uh, I, I sounded like that. I was horrendous. And I hadn't prepared anything either, which wasn't, you know, right. not great. I finished speaking and this, the president of the Jewish community walks over to me and he congratulates me like I've just won a presidential debate. He walks up to me and he says, you've got it. You have it. I said, have what? He said, y- you're a speaker. And I was I, naive enough to believe these people that believed in me. And they've made me what I am today. Best advice is you have to believe that anything is, Hashem loves you, anything is possible. If you create that negative space in your head, it'll be real. But if you create positive stuff in your head with other people, project it onto others. Look at the great, everyone has faults, we know that. But everyone is also a gem. A gem, the, the, the jigsaw of Klalisra is incomplete without you and without me and without the random stranger on the street. We have no right to trample on anybody's cover. We, we're a team. We're a team, like limbs in a body. We can't do without one of them. And I, I just, you know, that my best advice is when people believe in you and you believe in you and you believe in others. Worst advice is the negativity of like calling out others and uh, I don't think there's room for that something I wanted to say I I think we're basically finished here but something I wanted to say 
throughout that you kept on reminding. It's it's a random line my friend Usher Freed made it up. He had like a whole comedy a bit about it, about the word extraordinary. And he's like, if you take it down, he was like, oh, it was funny the way he did it, but I'm I'm not going to be funny with that. He's basically saying that like extraordinary just means it's ordinary, but it's extra. It's extraordinary. Beautiful. Absolutely. That's yeah. Mm. And I think the the lesson that you're giving over about people in Gibraltar and technically the people everywhere and anywhere, Correct. we we all are extraordinary Correct. because we are all extraordinary. I could tell you so many stories about just ordinary people, just davening and davening and davening. I got a voice note from the guy. The, the new father in my story. And he, he thanked me for giving them chizuk for all these times to never stop davening. It's easy for me to say as the rabbi on the podium, but he did it for 15 long, hard years. I could tell you so many stories of people who just didn't give up. And the extraordinary happens. We're davening for Mashiach, right? In this crazy, scary, COVID-ridden, Delta variant world. We can't daven with any less energy. It needs more from us. And we need to... We, we have to keep it going. We'll get out of this. I mean, Hashem is good. It's Hashem. It, exactly. People will be listening to this episode in your shine. Oh, man. It's, we'll be dancing with this episode in yeah. your shine. Thank you. Thank it's you. Hashem. All the best. Thank you so much. That was a great episode. Yeah, that was super interesting. Um, and for those who want to visit Gibraltar. 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 With the R at them, yeah. I think, like, there's. He said so many stories that were just so divine. He's so good. He, I, you know what? It's I, worth it to go just I, to spend the Shabbos with I him. Make, I mean, I'm putting you on the spot here, but I think there should be more meaningful minutes with Nogi. I agree. He's, I think no, we'll, get, we'll get some I think this. he's like, he reminds me in a certain way. They're not the same, but he, he reminds me of Charlie Harari in a certain way. Again, very different people, but like he's so inspirational to listen to. Plus, that accent. That accent. Right? Can, you, can you try replicating it? Do you know how, like... I, I my shot wasn't good. I could try, but blind me, I can't. Oh, that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I think I think I'm trying, but no words are I coming think we're, out. We're okay at interviewing. I think at accents, we're both terrible. I can't do it. Everything I try just goes to like. But for the rest of the episode, let's try talking with the uh, accent. So if you enjoy this episode, go please... to Gourmet Glot. No, what is that? What accent Didn't is that? Pay us to say that. I know, but I'm just looking. I at mean, it. you can still go there. They're great. They're a great place. But um, but but also, I want to say that you know, a lot of people listening to this episode. We, we are from like like Mississippi now. I mean, from a made up place because Mi- that has the accent. I'll say I'll talk right there because I can't do this. But if you listen to this episode or watch that, I bet you like. Ravnoki's not as, you know, obviously not as known as, let's say, Yako Shwaki or Ruvain Feinstein. But if you enjoy this episode as much as we did, please share this episode with others who say, hey, you might not know him or you do know him. Go check him out. Listen to how beautiful stories he has formulated with sentences. Yeah, and how amazing the Jewish community is in Gibraltar slash Ur. Yeah, Gibraltar. Ciao.